All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined from all the way over in Florida by Steve Gavator. How are you doing, Steve? I'm well, well, good to be here. Happy to be here after, especially after last week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And Steve is in Tampa in Florida. And as, uh, as you know, by the time this goes live, it'll be about three or four weeks ago. But as you know, there was just a major hurricane pass through devastation, loss of life. I mean, truly traumatic event. Uh, thankfully, where Steve is was spared. But obviously, our thoughts are with all those other people who were not spared, people who who lost lives, people who lost property, people who, you know, whose lives have been severely disrupted. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about today, because, uh, you know, Steve and the Steve Gavitorta Group, uh, which is a speaking training and, and coaching organization. Um, Steve, you wrote the book. Uh, when was the book published, In Defense of Adversity? Uh, 2018. So yeah. it was uh, kind of strange. It was actually pretty good timing, considered what, what's happened the last three years. <laughs> Um, so, like. uh, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, 2018, yeah. it was launched and uh, still yeah. selling well and still uh, a hot topic uh, to this day, as you would you would uh, understand. Yeah, yeah, because let's face it, as I said to you just before we came on uh, on air, I mean, we're used to dealing with I mean, I guess. I was sort of point to the fact that I came here from Ireland in the late, in the mid to late 90s. It came to Silicon Valley. So since I've been in America, I had the dot-com implosion, did 9-11, we had the financial crisis, we had COVID. And, and you're thinking, okay, there's got to be a, there's, there's definitely a pattern. There's a crisis that comes along, you know, every, every number of years. Well, we've just decided to start, forget the in-between years. We've now have, we've had COVID, we now have inflation, we have war, we have um, mother nature wreaking havoc. Yeah. So it's, so what do you say, Steve, to people who are just like, Oh my goodness! Um, is, is me and my business? Is it ever going to? Am I ever going to be able to do this? Am I ever going to catch a break? Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. My the tagline of my business, which I created this, I started talking about this years ago in my uh, my capabilities video. I said this even before everything happened that we are in a fast paced, high tech, ever evolving world. Change is hitting us faster than ever. Uh, adversity striking us deeper than ever. And the speed at which we need to make decisions is getting tighter and tighter and tighter. This is the new way of the world. So this was kind of my tagline, even before all this stuff broke loose. And uh, it tied into my book as well, too. And I was talking to my clients, talking to, to people a long time ago, that these are, this is the new norm and you better get used to it. I don't mean that flippantly. That yeah. this is a fact of nature. Change is going to be the constant. Adversity is going to be a constant. Problems are going to be the constant. And I truly believe individuals, companies uh, that can not just that can um, not just survive these times, but thrive on them, will create a point of differentiation for their product and services because the the margin for success has now gotten even tighter. So again, I don't want this to sound flippant, but I, you know, I tell people one of the first things you need to do uh, two things, uh, accept, accept that adversity is a part of life. Mm -hmm. And number two, acknowledge that adversity is an opportunity to grow, transform, evolve, to get that competitive edge, to take uh, market share away from your customers or to do something great in spite of all the obstacles. You know, mm -hmm. I don't want to say, hey, just live with it. It'd be a tough guy. But there's plenty mm -hmm. of information scientifically, too, that says accepting that this is a part of life, it can affect the brain and how we can function during adverse times, keeping a rational, logical, reasoned state of mind rather than an emotional one. So that, yeah. those, those are two yeah. things. It's your mindset, how you look at adversity, how you uh, uh, are willing to accept it and acknowledge that, hey, this stuff happens. It's happening more now than ever. Mm -hmm. And it's a chance for me to grow. It's a chance for me to be a better leader, a chance for us to grow our business, a chance for us to grow our market share, whatever that might be. Um, it's an opportunity. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And if you think about it, Steve, right, uh, as you said, adversity brings opportunities. You can, you know, bring new products, you can pivot, you can do all of these 
you can do all of these things. But what it does do is it, it, it forces you to take a good hard look at your business, maybe ones that, you know, when times are not even when times are good, but when times are OK, we just kind of live with it. Like we think oh, yeah, we live with this efficiency or but that product's not doing too well, but it's OK because it's been made. So we live, you know, we, we just uh, live with a lot of stuff. Uh, I think now we have to question ourselves and say we can't live with these things because they could become they could become uh, an anchor for us in the next crisis. So we have to be very focused, streamline our business, make sure it's highly efficient, make sure we're That's focused right. in the right places. Yeah, about I forget how many years ago I'm, 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 I just turned 60 recently that when um, Target and Walmart became efficient, you know, the focus was supply chain. Mm -hmm. becoming effective in a supply chain them the, as retailers becoming pushing that down on manufacturers who i used to work for i used to sell toothpaste mm -hmm. i used to sell health beauty aids mm -hmm. but walmart and target being more efficient driving efficiency driving tighter margins forced the manufacturers to d be much smarter business people mm -hmm. as well too you know we used to give money away and the, the question was did that ad work? Did you get bang for your buck with that ad? I don't know. We did it before. We're going to do it again. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when we were forced to start watching our dime and forced to spend more intelligently, we really did. And we started, became disciplined to do the right thing. So in my experience in, in industries, when they've been hit with adversity or deep change, you know, those companies that were, were prepared and they were willing to make those changes and take advantage often became better companies and the people that work for them became better mm. businessmen and women too. I know I did. So, and, and I think there's another thing too, is I, um, is, is you can't wait for the, you, I mean, there's still some people are trying to wait for things to go back to normal, whatever the hell normal means nowadays, which I, I have no idea. But, but I think the, the other part of it too, is, as you said, is not, is looking at it now. I remember the financial, when the financial crisis hit and I was running a, I was running a couple of businesses for, for a large, uh, a parent company. And suddenly some of our biggest customers in, in, in my business, one's multinational companies, right? And, the people were able to, you know, that we dealt with, they were local managers in, in country regions. They could sign off 100, 200 grand, like no problem, pay you for yeah. the services. Suddenly, it was all going back to the leadership in, in Japan. There were big, a couple of these companies, big, big companies, right? And, and that has never really come back because, yes, I mean, uh, you know, the people have got more autonomy in the last while to spend again and all of that. But it's never really come back that people are free spending and the budgets are like they used to be like pre the, the financial crisis. So I think those are realities that you have to face and figure out, OK, how am I going to how am I going to configure my business to the fact that people are going to be a little bit risk averse and not a little bit. They're going to be very risk averse yeah. probably going yeah. forward. And that's going to be your biggest challenge is, is persuading them that of all the things they want to do or need to do, yours is the most important. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I, you know, I think there's a lot of brain psychology, you know, there's a psychology to selling and really, mm -hmm. um, I think now more than ever making emotional connections with customers, consumers is more important than ever. And than ever. I, um, I often quote, um, a Harley Davidson executive who stated that what we sell is the opportunity for 43 year old accountants to dress up in black leather, drive through small towns and scare people. <laughs> yeah. They don't sell motorcycles. They sell an experience. They sell mm -hmm. a lifestyle. And with that said, they've been able to create a point of differentiation for them, their product and products versus their competition. They decommoditize themselves. So mm -hmm. things such as price isn't as much of a factor with a Harley Davidson consumer. I'm not yeah. saying price goes away. But it's still it's not as relevant because they've made that emotional connection. They they're not selling the commodity. They're not selling the widget, so to speak. Mm -hmm. They have made emotional connection. They're selling experiences. They're selling a lifestyle. They're selling something greater. And with that, they're not just selling motorcycles. They're selling accessories, clothing, belts, boots, and everything comes <laughs> along with it. So that whole philosophy of making that emotional connection being viewed as a, uh, as a uh, fun thing, a solution for someone 
has really created a point of differentiation for them. And I think companies like that, uh, that are able to make that emotional connection and whether it's a business emotional connection or a personal emotional connection, those companies are the ones that are going to really survive, uh, not just survive, I should say, but thrive in mm -hmm. these uncertain environments as well, too. The commodity sell being viewed uh, for your price, the lowest price being viewed as a commodity, a transactional relationship, those are going to go by the wayside because margins mm -hmm. are getting tighter, demand's lower, people don't want to spend yeah. the money, your <laughs> margins are going to get tighter too. And how do you invest and spend? How do you pay bills when margins are razor thin in an uncertain economy? So making yeah. an emotional connection, connecting with customers in that manner, creating a point of differentiation, I think is a key. Yeah, because that race to the bottom normally ends very abruptly uh, when everybody yeah. hits it. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. So, so here's the other thing, and I totally agree with you. I think on the on the human connection, and I think the authenticity, and I think that some people misinterpret that because I hear a lot of people now saying today, "Oh, you know, you've got you need to be more authentic." So here's how you can be more authentic. You know, and you say, "Well, that's not really how authenticity works," but that's okay. Um, <laughs> but I think it's more about, and it's not about putting bumper stickers on your website and sort of trying to show that you know, "Oh, we're we're about this, and we're about." This. It's actually just about how you engage with people. And when people engage with you and people want humans to engage with them, they want to feel like there's people behind the brand. They want to feel that they're seen and heard and understood. Okay. All those things that we preached about for years, I think they have become even more important now. And if you as a business are not looking at how do you engage and not just in the sales process, but how do you engage across the whole customer experience? If you're not looking at that, then then you're in for a world of hurt. That's right. That's right. You should, everyone should view their products as a service, a solution. It's not a commodity business. We're there to solve a problem, fulfill a need. And yeah, that's everybody kind of will probably listen and say, yeah, sure. that makes sense, doesn't it? But when we engage with customers, when we're in selling dynamics, sales personnel or companies often come from a, a, a selfish perspective. Here's what we do. Here's what we can sell you. Here's what we, you know, what we, what we're about without really understanding uh, the customer side, what they're going through, what their needs are, and how to be a solution, a problem solver for that. I work with a lot of companies in the um, in the uh, tools side of the world, uh, drills, mm -hmm. saws, drill bits, uh, nails, and hammers. And I always tell the people they call primarily on Home Depot and Lowe's. Right. I always tell people you don't sell drills, saw, uh, drill bits, saws, blades, you know, nails. You sell the ability for a retailer to grow their top line sales slash cash flow because cash flow is king in a business. You don't have cash yep. flow, you can't pay the bills, you can't invest and spend. The second part of it is to drive profitability. And the third part of, uh, part of that is provide me some incremental growth. Have mm -hmm. consumers, have consumers buy more of what you're selling or buy it, buy your product or from us when you weren't planning to in the first place, that incremental sales. So mm -hmm. I always tell my, my, my people, you don't sell the widgets. You don't, you sell solutions. If you're selling to a, a, a business of a retailer, you're there to, to grow top line sales, profitability and market share or some sort of growth mechanism. However, they view that if you're selling directly to the consumers, you're there to, again, provide them a service, make that emotional connection, solve a problem, make their life more exciting and fun. Uh, help them get healthy again, whatever that might be. You, thinking more from your customer's vantage point is more important now than ever. And yes, it sounds logical. It sound, every, a lot of people are going to say, yeah, we do that. But I have to ask, do you really? Yeah. I've been, yeah. At, this a long, I've been at this a long time and, 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 and most companies aren't real good at it. And you can see a lot of the thinning of the herd is happening now. Uh, during these times, these crazy times, mm -hmm. because a lot of those companies aren't really meeting, understanding their customer needs yeah. and providing relevant solutions to them, uh, for them. Yeah. And, and, and I, listen, sorry, go we're not, they're going through a lot of emotional turmoil, too. If we can mm -hmm. make their life easier, if we can bring them satisfaction in this time, that's a point of differentiation. I also do work in the uh, construction arena, and I have a friend who's a developer. And he says that he goes to bed nervous and wakes up scared. Wow. So because it's such an intense business sure. and there's supply chain issues, yeah. manpower issues, labor issues, deadlines, money. 
you know, and I always, I always tell my clients, those of you calling on general contractors, developers, if you can help someone like my friend sleep at night, you have a friend for life, mm -hmm. <laughs> a relationship for life. You're going to grow your business um, and you're going to have a long term customer as well, too, because if you're solving that guy's problem and helping him sleep at night, sure as heck, he's going to call you with new business or, or opportunities mm -hmm. down the road because you've been a solution provider for him. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a that's a that's a fantastic point. Yeah, and I guess in the in the his family and everybody connected to him would probably thank you too, if he gets a good <laughs> night's sleep. <laughs> um, but but yeah, the, the the but back to the point you're just making a moment ago is yeah, I mean every everybody will say well we're customer centric, we care about our customers, we serve our customers all, and and I always sort of say to people. You know, you can test that out. Go, go have a customer experience. Go contact your support, or go contact whatever. Just see, see how it ha see how it works. Because sometimes you'll find that in they think they've got this great system set up where bots. The first thing you hit is bots, and bots will answer for you. And you're thinking, no, if I'm a customer and I'm upset, the last thing I want is a bot. Not the first That's thing I exactly want is a bot. Right. Yeah. And so we we have to rethink that. We have got to get out of this convenient for us but not for you mentality. That's right. Well, again, I think that goes to a lot of companies trying to cut the costs, you know, trying to do things. And I completely understand driving efficiencies, but sure. there has to be a balance between driving efficiencies and still able to make that human connection with the customer. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think the younger generation, even though they may be more astute, uh, technolo technically, technological, technologically astute, I still think they want some sort of human connection. And there are still a lot of boomers out there that want that human connection too. So I would say for companies, don't under, it has to be a fine balance between driving efficiencies in your organization, but still maintaining contact and closeness with your customer. Mm -hmm. And again, being a problem solver. Yeah. Uh, how does your product and service make my life better? How does your product service make my life easy? How does your product service bring me joy or, mm -hmm. or solve that problem or whatever? There has to be a fine line uh, between the two. And I guess the other part, uh, Steve, just to conclude is that, you know, in times of adversity, you you have the choice about how you show up, right? I mean, you have the choice. You can go, the world's on top of me. Everything's going to wherever in a handbasket. Hand basket. And it may well be so, but by by projecting that to the world, you're not going to help yourself. So that's right. Uh, right. Part of it is the choice of saying, "Yeah, things may be rough right now, but I have two choices: I can give up, or I can, you know, wear my heart on my sleeve, or you know what, I can, I can uh, pull up my bootstraps and say, okay, 'Okay, I'm going. Come on, let's let's get back that's into right. this. I'm going to give it my best shot.'" That's right. Well, I think now I'm sure you've heard the emotional intelligence. A lot of people sure. have heard that phrase before. But I think EQ in leadership and throughout an organization is more important than ever. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have that high emotional intelligence, you are not going to be as successful as you could be. I always talk about three components of emotional intelligence. One is intrapersonal skills, mm -hmm. understanding yourself, how you deal with adversity, how you communicate, how you behave, how you solve problems, how you deal with change, risk, and conflict. Because the more you can know that about yourself as a leader, as a salesperson, the more effective you're going to be. As all these things are coming down, you're going to be able to function more effectively. That's number one. The second part is interpersonal skills. Um, raising the awareness of other people and how they deal with adversity, mm -hmm. change, risk, and conflict. So you can lead them effectively and they can stay calm, calm and collected. And the third part about that is adaptability, your ability and your organization's ability to solve problems, mm -hmm. to think creatively, to minimize conflict, um, to, to uh, gain a competitive advantage, whatever that might be. Skills now, it's basic selling skills and leadership skills are still much needed to, as ever. But I think other skills such as making good decisions, problem solving, uh, critical thinking, creative thinking are more skills uh, that are relevant now than they've ever been and maybe even take precedence over some of those other skills. So raising your emotional intelligence as a leader, raising the emotional intelligence of your organization. So when the proverbial 
poop hits the fan, mm -hmm. we're able to, again, solve problems, think creatively, uh, uh, minimize conflict, and once again, keep our eye on the ball that we are a company that provides a, provides a product and service that's a solution for our customers' needs or something that is a desire for them to have. Keeping that logical mindset in this crazy world will, again, create a point of differentiation. So that's yeah. kind of my thoughts yeah. on that. No, uh, fantastic, Steve. And I love that point, uh, the first one about the intrapersonal skills, because I do think people often overlook that piece is, is before you start worrying about how the organization and how your team and how everybody else uh, manages adversity or, or how they react is like, take a look at yourself and see how you react. So I think that's a really good point. I think that's one I want to underline because we often, it's like accountability. If you ever say to people, um, oh, what do you think? There's, we, we need to have personal accountability in here. And everybody will say, yes, we do. But they actually mean for you, not for them. <laughs> Listen, if something, ne it's right. If something negative happens and I'm a leader, C-suite, C VP of sales, whatever that is, and I'm prone to losing my patience, getting angry, mm -hmm. yelling and screaming, I am no longer productive. Mm -hmm. That's low EQ. I'm, I'm not conscientious of my own behavior. That's low EQ. And my poor behavior uh, harms my thinking. I can't think rationally. I can't think logically. That in turn spreads through an organization. The people underneath me shut down. They, they go into freeze mm -hmm. fight or flight or some combination of this. They are no longer productive. So we as a leadership team an organization are no longer functioning on all cylinders in a rational thinking state of mind. And when we're not in that rational thinking state of mind, we won't be able to solve problems. We won't be able to think creatively. We won't make wise decisions. So, you know, raising that EQ, first thing is I said, accept and acknowledge adversity mm -hmm. is, is the way of the world because that keeps us in that rational state of mind. If, if something happens and I don't accept it, I get angry about it, yeah, I'm gone. I'm not thinking of logical yeah. anymore. So that's why up front I said accept and acknowledge that adversity is a part of life. It's a chance for us to uh, grow, transform, and evolve. And I, if I can keep that mindset, always keep yeah. an eye on the ball, keep the eye on satisfying my customers' needs. Uh, again, I think it's a, uh, it's a great way to gain a competitive advantage in these uh, crazy times. Yeah, for sure. Listen, thank you, Steve. This is fantastic. All of Steve's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, Steve, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Yeah, I own a coaching training consulting company. I fashion myself as a consultant, a solution provider myself. Um, I work with my clients to uncover their needs and I build relevant solutions to meet those needs, whether it's a, a, a consultative selling type approach, leadership, team building, um, dealing with change, risk, and conflict, everything we've talked about today. Um, I build custom-based programs to meet those respective needs. Yeah, well, listen, I would advise everybody, as I said, the links would be below. Go check out Steve's work and uh, you know, maybe prepare yourself. This, let's face it, I think I can confidently say there's more adversity around the corner. No idea what it is, but given our track <laughs> record so far, it's surely out there, so we might as well get ahead of it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right, listen, thanks, Steve. Thank you for watching and listening, and I will see you all again soon. Thank you.